Despite the season not going as planned, Allie Kelly has been incredible since joining Syracuse as a grad transfer. So far this season, she's broken not one, but two Syracuse hockey records. It's officially lax season as the Orange men's lacrosse team has aspirations of getting back to the NCAA tournament. The non-conference schedule for Syracuse is one of the toughest in the country. And earlier today, we had a top five matchup in the Dome. Despite what bracketologists are showing, there's still hope for the Orange to go dancing in the big tournament. Syracuse has some work to do, but the NCAA tournament is still in reach when you look at teams currently on the bubble. Wildcard weekend wrapped up today with not one, but two matchups. Steelers and Bills were originally scheduled to play yesterday, but the snowstorm caused it to be postponed. DeAsia Fair has been a standout player for the Syracuse women's basketball team since transferring from Buffalo. Tonight against Clemson, she had the opportunity to become the first player in Syracuse and ACC history to reach 3,000 career points. The historic season for SU women's basketball continues tonight on the road in Charlottesville. The Orange try to get one step closer to locking up the double bye in the ACC tournament. After a lackluster performance Tuesday night against Florida State, the Orange showed their resiliency once again this season with a 77-65 win over NC State. J.J. Starling led the way for Syracuse with 26 points, and while the sophomore guard told me he was excited about that and will celebrate it tonight, he said more work is to be done later this season. April showers bring May flowers, but March brings spring football practices. Now all eyes turn to Fran Brown and Kyle McCord as the new faces of Syracuse football get their first chance to show what the Orange are going to be made of next season. For the first time since the year after he left Creighton, Oregon head coach Dana Altman will face his old squad tonight. Altman saying post game Thursday that he sees Oregon as a 1A to Creighton being a 1B and when it's all said and done, he's going to love them equally the same. Welcome back to our special NCC Sports Report. I'm Drew Von Sayo alongside Madison Palumbo, Taylor Massetta, and we have a lot to talk about here this afternoon. The WNBA draft taking place last night and one of our own, DeAsia Fair, taken 16th overall going to the defending WNBA champions, the Las Vegas Aces. So I just wanted to ask you both, you know, what were your thoughts about Fair not going in the first round? She was originally projected to go there. And were there any concerns in your opinion about her size and how it would translate to the professional level? And I think the biggest thing for me is going back to the financial side of it, because the WNBA hasn't been in this position before where you have a such a talented draft class. I think it's one of those things now where you're going to really start to see the WNBA grow. Caitlin Clark's jersey sold out within three hours of the first round ending last night. So if that doesn't speak to where the WNBA is headed in terms of revenue coming from fans, TV engagement, I don't know what does. And I think it's one of those things where as Camila Cardoso, Angel Reese, Cameron Brink, and Caitlin Clark as well, as they continue to grow and develop in the WNBA and start making it to the WNBA finals more often, the league is really going to skyrocket. And I'm not going to say that it's ever going to catch the NBA, but it's going to be pretty darn close. Joey Spilina and the number five orange take on the number four Maryland Terrapins. We jump to the third quarter, SU trailing by two, and it's Luke Roa who keeps it himself bouncing it into the bottom corner and gets the orange within one. Just a few seconds later, Joey Spilina showing why he wears that special number 22, completely fooling Logan McNaney to tie it at six. Early fourth quarter, tied at nine. Michael Leo with the left-handed shot, squeaking it past McNaney to put Syracuse on top. The Terps continue to battle as Eric Spanos takes the ball from X and sidearms it past Will Mark for a one goal lead. Just 70 seconds left in regulation. It's Owen Hiltz to Christian Mule. He snipes it into the top corner. That ties the game up again as fans definitely got their money worth. And then the controversial overtime goal. Leo scores, but he's in the goal mouth, so it's waved off. Maryland gets a chance to win it. Very next possession. Owen Murphy, no defender in sight, beating Will Mark as Maryland edges past Syracuse in overtime, 13-12 and let the goal mouth rule debates begin around the world of college lacrosse. The matchup everyone was hoping for, Caitlin Clark and Iowa taking on Angel Reese and LSU, a rematch in the Elite Eight of last year's championship. 
Angel Reese intercepting Caitlin Clark's pass. Plenty of space to take that one the distance. Layup puts the Tigers in front. Late second quarter now, it's Clark going behind the back, showing off her hands, tying the game at 41. Now it's Clark again, trying to gain separation, does just that. Deep three forces the LSU timeout as Caitlin Clark just continues to do Caitlin Clark things. Now in her sweet spot from the left wing with a bang, Iowa starting to pull away. Clark one more time has the space to hit a deep two, says, no, I want three right in the face of Angel Reese as well to put an emphasis on that one. Late in the fourth quarter, Clark this time going to dish it off to Hannah Stalky, who gets that layup to go in off the glass. Iowa getting revenge from last year's title game, moving on to the final four after winning this one 94-87. The Hawkeyes will take on UConn in the final four. As the NHL gears up for the Stanley Cup playoffs, we get one last round of the rivalry between the Devils and the Rangers. We're all set for the opening faceoff as Matt Rempe stares down McDermott and a fight begins. All five players start throwing punches in response to Rempe elbowing Jonas Siegenthaler in the face the last time these two teams met. They would accumulate 166 penalty minutes in this game as the Rangers sweep the season series over the New Jersey Devils. After a two-year break from lacrosse, Mason Cohn once again became a two-sport athlete at Division III Tufts, where he also played hockey. He made 22 starts in two years, where he won 67% of his face-offs and was an all-NESCAC honoree. Knowing he had another year of eligibility, Cohn postponed his academic future for one more ride on the lacrosse field. I was originally planning on going to law school just upon graduating and the opportunity to play a fifth year came up in the spring of my senior year so I ended up deferring my admission to law school and then um, kind of like shopped around and looked at different schools and Syracuse ended up being the right fit so we kind of plugged in here before I figured out what I was going to do academically. Once the decision was made to use his last year of eligibility, Cohn knew the portal was going to be intense. Making the jump from Division Three to Division One wasn't going to be easy. Coach Gates says it was never a doubt that Cohn could compete at the highest level. I, I think he's, you know, Mason's a Division One athlete, and uh, you know he's playing Division Three hockey. But I'm sure he could have the opportunity. He did have the opportunity to play Division One hockey, and uh, you know, pick the school that fit him best. Uh, and you know, we got lucky that. He looked at Syracuse and, you know, we, we certainly were hoped he would be everything that he is and he's delivered so far, so we're thrilled. Division three athletes often get the reputation that they aren't good enough to play Division one or they aren't good enough to play professionally. Cohn says it's not about the level at which you play your collegiate sport. It's about going to a program where you're valued not only as a player, but as a person. One thing I, my coach at Tufts used to say was, go where you're wanted, like your experience will be a lot more rewarding and fun and there's great resources and great teams everywhere. Um, you know, if you're, nothing wrong with being a walk on a Division One program or anything like that, but for some people the better fit might be to be the guy at a Division Three program and then you are a late bloomer and you get a great opportunity like this. So there's a lot of different ways to work for things to work out and I think just getting to play college athletics in general is a, is a blessing, it's something that you should be grateful for regardless of the, the division level. Cone's journey to Division I is proof that anybody can play at any level of college athletics. He's going out there and proving it. One face-off at a time. Drew Von Sayo, NCC Sports.